I'm always trying to embody this idea of we're asking not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you yeah, and what happened to you and your people. And so I tend to bring that into my work a lot as a therapist is like that balance between let's explore the trauma, but also let's explore from a strengths-based view what's going on well. And how do we bring that in to kind of recalibrate, rebalance the trauma? We're always trying to connect with the hurt child and see someone in their best light, regardless of what actions they're doing. We understand that behaviors are ways of trying to meet needs. And sometimes we don't know exactly like how to do that in an effective way. That little hurt child, it doesn't just grow up on its own. It has to be like nourished to grow up. Otherwise there's a part of us that always stays in that frozen place. Welcome to Tia's for Trauma, where we explore the lived experience of trauma and the lessons we can learn from it. My guest today is Brie Liu. Brie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Brie, you are a licensed professional counselor mm-hmm. since 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, you focus on social justice, providing accessible trauma-informed care, and working with uh, first-generation immigrant communities mm-hmm. and uh, BIPOC communities. And you are trained in a variety of modalities, including somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, and trauma-informed yoga. Mm-hmm. And you are a lead therapist at the YWCA, and you also have your own private practice. Mm-hmm. And previously, you have worked with the unhoused community with complex mental and physical needs. Yes. So every episode begins with a gratitude. Mm-hmm. And the gratitude today is, um, first of all, for your work providing affordable and accessible care to mm-hmm. individuals. I, I think that is a very important cause, in, especially in America, um, where mm-hmm. the healthcare situation definitely needs work. But then also for your work with immigrant communities, which I think, um, especially in the last couple of years, has become incredibly important. Mm-hmm. And uh, I am incredibly grateful for that. Thank you. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. I'm excited to see where our conversation will take us today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited <laughs> because uh, you are a therapist <clears throat> who is uh, still quite young in their career. Mm-hmm. And I've had other mental health professionals on the show. And uh, I think they uh, represent the more experienced part of the spectrum, but I'm also very curious to explore your, uh, experiences and also your thoughts as someone who is, um, a lot younger in their career. I think you can bring a unique perspective to that conversation that, um, I'm really excited to kind of dig into. Yeah. I'm excited to explore it as well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, We originally connected uh, through a training that you uh, hosted around uh, trauma-informed care, and that was with the YWCA. Mm -hmm. And during that uh, presentation, you uh, led a somatic practice, Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you would be open to recreating that experience here today to Mm -hmm. begin the podcast. Yes, definitely. Um, I forgot to ask this before we started. Is it okay to like stand up if we need to, or should we do it all seated? Because I can do it either way. Uh, probably seated okay. works better. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So I think the invitation to begin, let's go ahead and just orient to our space together. So visually, we can just start to look around space, really letting our eyes travel. And you can look up, down, really stretching the eye muscles. So our eyes, um, when we are in distress, the muscles around start to get really tight. And Mm -hmm. so we can start to get very tunnel visioned, literally. So just even being able to break your eye gaze and start to gaze around can really start to send signals of safety back to your body. And then when you're ready, let's go ahead and just start to bring our attention to any points of contact our body is making with the surface. Maybe you notice your feet against the ground. Notice your back against the chair. And if you'd like, and it feels supportive to you right now, 
we can go ahead and just see if we can soften just a little more into the um, supports. Just letting you me yourself melt. Noticing what shifts or doesn't shift as you take in the support. Uh, the floor is an extension of the earth, and I think it's really helpful to have this anchor to come back to, knowing that the earth is always here to support you. We always have, if we'd like, walls and chairs to support us when we're inside. When you're ready, you can also start to notice your breath. There's no need to change it at this point, um, but in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, Attending to our breath is our first step in taking care of ourselves. And so our breath can also become an anchor for us if that's supportive. Just noticing what it's like to notice your inhales, your exhale. And when you're ready at your own pace, you can start to deepen that really intentionally. Maybe noticing what shifts, doesn't, the quality of your thoughts, any images that might be coming up. What sensations do you notice? What emotions? Just taking an internal weather forecast. And if it's helpful, you can kind of land on one of these, one word, one sentence, one phrase that maybe describes your internal forecast in this moment. Noticing and when you're ready, we can start to take a few, um, a few breaths together. You can do three breaths, inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the mouth. So when you're ready, we'll go. Again. We'll do it one more time. If you like, you just shake your body out in any way, and that'll be the end of our practice. Excellent. Yeah, I feel very grounded right now, <laughs> and hopefully everybody listening or watching at home also feels the same. Yeah. Um, what I love about this practice is it's something that you can do, you can integrate it into your daily day, <laughs> daily life, very easily, just one or two minutes, taking some time, orienting, and coming in, and then coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, where did you grow up? I grew up mostly in Georgetown, Texas. So yeah. it's 30 minutes away from here um, in Austin. And um, I was actually born on the West Coast in Oregon. And uh, my parents are originally from Guangzhou, China. Got it. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's uh, three very different places. <laughs> yes. Um, and just to flesh that out, so my first five years, a lot of moving actually. So from Oregon, we moved to, my mom was a researcher, so we moved to Iowa for a little bit and my dad stayed in Portland. And then we also, as a family, moved to or Montana. <laughs> That's where my sister was born. And then we came down to Texas. So okay. a lot of interesting, I think, cities and states that you don't normally think of when you think of the U.S. Yeah. And uh, what was it like for you growing up? Like, what was your childhood like? This question? Hmm. <laughs> I think multifaceted is probably the best way to put it. Um, so in Georgetown in the 90s, it was a really small town. I think now it's like one of the biggest growing like suburb areas, okay. I think, in all of the U.S. actually. Yeah. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> Fact check that. Um, but it was very small. Like literally, I remember there was a McDonald's, an HEB, and there was not much else. Wow. Okay. Uh huh. <laughs> and in the South. So literally, there was the only Asian family growing up. And I think maybe in high school, there are a few other families. But in my grade, I think I was the only um, East Asian person, at least. Yeah. And if not in the in my grade, it was at least in my classes because of segregation. And we can get into all of that um, later, gentrification. But right. I was the only person that looked like me in my classes consistently. Yeah. Um, so because of that, at the same time, I was able to, I, I never had any explicit messages necessarily that I didn't fit in. But I always had this internal sense of, 
don't quite fit in at school or I have to disconnect a lot from my um, culture, my Asian-ness and kind of like act as if I don't know as much as I do about my own culture. Right. Uh, which at the time I didn't know like how damaging that was. It wasn't until years later when I actually explored that, that I realized that it's really, um, it can be really damaging to have to split apart from, um, split apart from a part of your psyche. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, yeah I mean, it, if you just think even about like the kind of, prepubescent and then uh, pubescent period where you're trying to define your own personality and then you are navigating that nuance of do I want to fit in? Do I want to stand out? Exactly. Um, and then you add the complexity of race and, and culture and uh, like you said, you know, not having any other people around mm -hmm. that you can kind of look to for those examples it, it just sounds incredibly complicated yeah. for a child of that age it's very complicated and i think also it was specifically very complicated because i wasn't getting a lot of explicit messages necessarily i have some experiences that i have like remembered of like um like experiencing like racism very explicitly uh, there's a lot of microaggressions don't get me wrong like definitely all throughout but i didn't experience a lot of that explicitness and so I think because of that, I always had this narrative of, hmm, I, I guess I didn't know what to make of my experiences because I could pass in that. Right. Yeah. 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 I would also imagine around that time, things were not as cut and dried or, mm -hmm. or uh, clear cut as maybe they are now. I, I think the awareness of uh, racial issues it has definitely heightened in the last uh, probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think, again, as a child trying to make sense of some of those experiences, you, you maybe were not even aware that yeah. uh, something had happened. Yes, I didn't have the language for it. I, looking back, always had the sense of like the offness, you right. know, um, but I didn't have the language or like the frameworks or anything. So I think that's why once... Um, it was actually probably post-grad school. It started to do a little bit of this work in grad school, but it wasn't until post-grad school that it really all came together. Uh, but just having the language and then the um, the knowledge that there are so many people that actually experience this very similar experience, right. actually similar but unique. And so that's why I say like multifaceted, very yeah. par paradoxical um, experience very empowering and just very normalizing, validating. <laughs> uh, in college, um, did that experience change for you? Did you um, find more diversity? There's a lot more diversity because I went to UT Austin. Okay. Um, and on, at the time though, it was almost a culture shock for my system because I had gone, I went from being the only Asian face to being surrounded by many people that look like me. And at the same time in Austin, you can also kind of get away with, or not get away, what's the word, I'm gonna phrase this. Um, there's also enough white people around too, that if you haven't done your work and you're not sure like what to make of that experience of transitioning, you can like stick to white groups and not right. do much mingling. And so some of my experience kind of, uh, it's also not clear cut, but not cut and dry clear, but I think my first few years, I didn't know what to make of that experience. And so I tended to hang out more with, um, I came to college with my high school best friend and I hung out a lot with her and I hung out with uh, predominantly white groups. And then it wasn't until later that then I started to branch out. Yeah. So long winded answer to say, um, actually, I don't remember what your initial question was. <laughs> Sorry. If, if there was more diversity in college. There's a lot more diversity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I mean, that, that was my follow up question was uh, once you found that more diverse environment, um, did you find yourself gravitating more towards uh, Asian groups and predominantly Asian groups? But it, it sounds like um, it was more about what you knew that um, yeah. you initially gravitated towards. What is it? I meant to look this up um there's like the fa five stages of racial development i want to say okay and i think i was must have been stuck in basically like pre-contemplation um where 
like I was starting to realize maybe I wasn't as happy or or like I was realizing that I might find like groundedness in Asian groups. Yeah. But I also wasn't ready to take that step. And then I didn't know what that was like. So I was working through a lot of internalized racism, actually, to yeah. be fully vulnerable and honest around that. Yeah, that, that, that's so interesting. I, that, I think that's something that uh, does not get discussed a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, what can you say about that, like in terms of how that showed up for you? Mm -hmm. So I'm noticing there's this part of me that still feels like some shame and guilt around having that part, while also knowing that it was very, like, protective. Um, but... What it looked like is I didn't really want to be around other Asian people. I think I felt like that threatened like my uniqueness because I had started to gravitate towards this idea that being Asian, that meant I was unique because that helped me survive through like my years in Georgetown. Right. And so I just didn't know what to do with that information when I was faced with, well, actually Asian people are like, like <laughs> so many people are Asian in the world, right? <laughs> so not unique. Yeah, your, your specialness is threatened. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do with that at that time. Um, and I didn't have anyone to talk to. So um, I'm the oldest daughter in my family. And then because I was the only one in school, a lot of times I didn't have, or the only like, Asian person in school, I didn't have like much mentorship. I didn't know like who to go to with these concepts. Um, now there's so much information out there. There's right. podcasts. There's so much social media. Um, that's why I think like memes and Instagram and TikTok actually is like really can be very healing because you have so many people talking about these same experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, in, in terms of the actual uh, communities represented at UT, mm -hmm. was there a large Chinese community? There's large Chinese um, must pro large Indian community or South Asian. Um, I think a lar pretty large, like Vietnamese community right. yeah. as well. And, um, decently large La um, Latinx community. Okay. Yeah. So later on, I started to hang out a lot with international students actually. Yeah. And so hanging out with like other ethnic groups, I think that was my bridge into then like really coming back into my own culture and like feeling like uh, craving, like wanting to hang out with other Asian people. But yeah. I did have that little bridge experience actually. Okay, yeah, you had like yeah. a little uh, little starter step yes. yeah, before fully getting into it. Yes, yeah. which um, I actually have some memories being, growing up as a kid and feeling like it wasn't that I didn't want to be Asian, but um, I wanted to fit in. And so I knew there were other Mexican Americans in Georgetown, actually. So I remember having some like distinct thoughts of like, I wish I was Mexican, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be white. <laughs> but I I just didn't want to stand out so much, I think. And so it's just funny that that had, like kind of came full circle, actually. So uh, switching topics a little bit, um, what made you want to become a therapist? Hmm. Where should I start in the story? Um, I don't think I necessarily explicitly knew this when I started pursuing being a therapist, but in hindsight, I really think it's that desire to really be with and be in connection with others. Um, I think growing up and feeling sort of like the guinea pig, I really didn't want other people to have that same experience. I wanted to be able to be there and support and be in connection. And... Um, when I took like a, I think it was called intro to individual counseling in grad school. This was during my senior year. I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted to go because uh, UT is a very research-based program. Yeah. And so there's a lot of encouragement and emphasis into the research track when you're psychology. So I was, a, I had my bachelor's, I was getting my bachelor's in psychology at that time. So it's very like you go into research and for them, counseling is housed in the educational psychology program. So it's a completely different department. Um, I think it, the applied work is all over there. But my advisor happened to like track everything I was saying and recommend I take that class. Um, but it was my last semester at that time. And when I sat in the role plays, it just felt so right yeah. to be in connection. Um, 
and even though like role plays always have like a little bit of like offness there's some like disingenuousness almost a little tiny bit i felt like oh when i was sitting with my role play mate cut through all of that it was so authentic um and that that really like in, in like inspired this fire in me to go ahead and pursue like uh, an applied counseling track when you say you connected to that um did you connect to it because it was familiar to you from childhood or did you connect to it because you had lacked that in childhood and and this now felt like a good calling for you like in terms of feeling like so like right in session you mean or well, well like basically my question is when you experienced that um did you feel like hey this is familiar and it feels right or yes did it feel like this is what has been missing and this is mm. what i want to go towards i think more of the first one yeah and then it wasn't until later that i put two and two to much later that i put two and two together that that was probably why it felt so right is yeah. because i had this missing and i wanted to like give back um I didn't realize that until I was like applying for other jobs. Actually, I was I worked as an academic assistant. Uh, yep. No, uh, nis, sorry, academic advisor for a while. <laughs> and it was there that the that I put two and two together that I really wanted to mentor other people. Um, at the same time, though, I have this really deep curiosity, so I want I always want to like learn more about other people. Um, I think that helps me better sit with others, though. That's not necessarily like my motivation in being a therapist though right yeah when you had started undergrad uh and an undergrad in psychology did you have an idea where you wanted to take that so i actually didn't start as um start out as a psychology student i started out as a biochem student okay um, <laughs> but as i was telling you before this started i cannot I like details with no context just <laughs> are not interesting to me <laughs> So my first year, it was okay. I like uh, had a harder time assimilating to the information than I thought I would, but it was okay. But it was my second year. I took like an organic chemistry class. It was also at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I, I'm not, a, I'm actually not an afternoon person. Okay. I'm a morning and nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> but afternoon's really hard. I would fall asleep literally during all the lectures. And it was like the professor was speaking a different language. <laughs> microbiology was worse so i realized i needed to make a change um but at that time i was definitely living out like my parents dream of go be a medical doctor right 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 yeah. so um but i can remember being a child and wanting to be a psychologist i don't think i knew what that meant but i would watch it on tv and i would think like oh that's really interesting that's gonna be me yeah. <laughs> and like on the surveys where they'd be like what do you want to be when you grow up i would fill that out um, but then I kind of lost sense of that and somehow found it back. Um, yeah. cause I knew I had, I was going to probably like, I was going to fail my science classes if I stayed in it and there was no way I would be able to advance to like junior level. So right. I needed to make that change. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, when you started along that path and it, it felt more aligned, were you automatically or, or like naturally uh effective in that like did that come naturally the, the classes and stuff yes yeah. it was like a world of difference it's like amazing concept that when you're interested and invested in something you're going to do much better you're going to retain the information and like care about it so huge shift um but then i see i was still kind of influenced by uh how do you categorize this Basically, I wasn't listening to myself and what I wanted to do. I think I always knew that I wanted to be a practicing therapist, but because there's like prestige in getting a PhD or pursuing research, I would like try to put myself in that lane and <laughs> nothing sparked there really. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, you know, you finish out grad school and uh, is the first actual uh, practical work you do with the unhoused communities? My first practical work, so like I said, I was actually an academic advisor right after I graduated. Um, so it's not, that wasn't like clinical work necessarily, but there's a lot of overlap. And actually the program that I worked under, I mean, the program that I was in at UT, it prepared me to work with college students. 
at the time when I pr applied for school, I wanted to work in like a college counseling mental health center. I became very interested in college student mental health and specifically like relation dis relationship distress and how that impacts well-being. Yeah. But now I'm going off track. So I did one year there. And at the same time, I was um, working at Capital. I was volunteering at Capital Area Counseling, which is another nonprofit clinic in town. And then my second placement to our second site was actually at Integral Care. Yeah. And, and was that the unhoused communities? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so w what did you learn from that experience of, of working with the unhoused communities? Well, I think it really gave me some real life, um, real life in my face experience around diagnoses don't mean much, but everything, I won't say like everything, I don't like to speak in absolutes, but pretty much everything is rooted in trauma. And so a lot yeah. of symptomology is rooted in untreated trauma. So there, I really, it was more like I was um, getting the real life experience that that was the case. Um, and then later I learned all about like trauma-informed philosophy and care. So I was having the real life experience and then I learned that there was, um, I guess like more academic research around it that I could use to even better under, uh, even better understand who I was working with. Yeah, we had been talking offline a little bit about um, Gabor Mate's book mm -hmm. in the realm of hungry ghosts, and that is a book which I believe came out in either two thousand five or two thousand nine, and it mostly focuses on his work um, in the downtown East Side, which is mm. a very large unhoused community, um, a lot of addiction issues. Mm -hmm. He is mm -hmm. working in an addiction uh, counseling uh, clinic, and. I mean, a lot of the focus of that book is on the uh, trauma-informed care or like how most of those issues, both um, the emotional issues or the addiction issues are rooted in trauma. And I mean, I, you know, I, I only really came to Gabor Mate in the last couple of years, but it seems like at the time that those uh, theories were relatively revolutionary, mm -hmm. um, but also somewhat controversial because I, I think people somewhat, and you know, I, I think this is also an issue today where mm -hmm. people are very uh, skeptical of trauma and, and also very skeptical of uh, what is and what is not trauma. And, you know, like, I, I think even with this podcast, you know, like, I think people sometimes bristle at this idea of like, oh, that this is trauma and that's trauma. And, I think, you know, I, I was listening to that book and I was really wondering, like, how far have we actually come mm. since, you know, the 20 or so years since that book came out? Or, like, how much have we actually changed our perception? Sure. This is a hard one to answer because I also wonder about it, too. Um, I feel like in some ways... It's hard for me to answer because I spend a lot of my time in circles that are all, um, what's the term, trauma, not trauma-informed, but they acknowledge trauma, right. <laughs> they're all about trauma. Yeah. And I also spend a lot of spaces in, um, time in spaces where people kind of are coming from unconventional lenses. So I'm steeped in that. But working with my interns, so I supervise interns at the YWCA. I know that the schools still, a lot of schools still tend to teach in these very mm, traditional ways of there's diagnoses, we focus on the cognitive, cognitive, they're not necessarily trained in trauma. So in that way, I actually kind of, it's hard for me to gauge where we're at. And then, so that's the piece of just like in the clinical world. And I think it gets even more complicated in so outside of the clin clinical world, like in the real world, how do people actually feel about trauma? I feel like t actually with TikTok, there's a lot more um, accessibility and information in some ways, yeah. TikTok and Instagram. So I think these ideas are getting more popular, but then they can get very like diluted or uh, reductionist, reductionistic. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I, I 
I'm only <laughs> tangentially aware of trauma talk, uh -huh. I believe, as it's uh, <laughs> referred to. Um, but also, I, I think kind of like the, uh, I don't want to say misdiagnosis, but kind of like people who are not trained mental health professionals. And, you know, a lot of these people making this content, they're oftentimes like not even adults. And it's uh, this labeling of everything <laughs> mm -hmm. as something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think I have very strong feelings about that of like uh, that being something of a double edged sword in terms of like, yes, it's good that you're aware of these concepts, but also you should be very cautious in terms of how you label that or um, if it's even accurate mm. in, in what you're doing. I agree with that, too. Um, I think labels can be helpful. And then they can also be really detrimental. So it's like, I think you need to do that in relationship. You can't, um, I think that's the power of counseling is that you get to explore these ideas in relationship. And um, it can possibly be harmful when you're doing all of this self-research on your own and really becoming very rigid in ideas. I think a lot of rigidity in general <laughs> tends yeah. to lead to dysfunction. And then uh, how did these shifts start to happen towards focusing on uh, working with immigrants or, or kind of mm. like what was the catalyst for the move in that direction? So I had to leave um, my job with the unhoused community because I was kind of getting crispy. I was starting to feel kind of burnt out. You're working with a lot of systems. And um, it was actually not a very easy decision because I thought that I would be in that world for a long time, actually. Um, but a lot of burnout. And um, I knew that I had to leave. Otherwise, I would not. I wouldn't have the same like unconditional positive regard for humans, I think, yeah. if I stayed too long. Um, so th my big shift, well, even back then, though, when I was at Capital Area, I noticed that I started to like resonate mostly with um, my clients who were black and also my clients who were children of immigrants and then also first gen as well as themselves. So I started to get the hunch that this is who I like, connect most with in this one on one space. Um, but it was probably not until uh, I was fully licensed at a group practice and the way I had written my um, intro, I think it was very inviting for these um, people who fit these identities as well. So my caseload started to get filled with people with these identities and it was a natural fit. Um, but my work really started to deepen, I think. Um, it started to deepen as I worked with these people, but also um, I would say like the pandemic also really like fast tracked a lot of my work as well in immigrant communities. Yeah. But I think I was already doing a lot of it before, too. So the time all kind of blurs together. Yeah. When you say the pandemic, was that at all correlated with the stop Asian hate stuff? Yes. Um, I was I think at that time I was at the beginning. I was starting to get even more connected with my racial identity and culture, and I had already done a little bit of work before, but I think probably that really um, because at the beginning, there is not a lot of time to do anything else other than be on the internet doing research. Right. At the start of the pandemic was also Black Lives Matter. And, yes. and also, like, let's talk about race and um, all of that. Um, yes. Those conversations started to really kick up. But this reminds me. So at the YWCA, that is probably when I started to, because the mission there is eliminating racism and empowering a woman. So... Um, we tend to work with a lot of people of color and also a lot of first and second gen immigrants there. So my caseload was also really expanding there. So I was getting like really rich experience and really enjoying it. And I was a school-based therapist. So I worked at a charter school that was predominantly Latinx. Also um, children of immigrants mostly. And I think that's really where it came together where I was like, I'm really enjoying this. Then by the time I went into the group practice is when I already like knew that was kind of my niche, I think. Yeah. So uh, what are some of the common issues that um, first generation immigrants mm -hmm. or uh, people of color um, come to a therapist with? So 
a lot of times they are coming with symptoms of anxiety and depression and then the roots are often in um like their relationship with race identity culture within themselves but also um like the systems like in relationship to themselves and also with the systems um there's also a lot of intergenerational trauma collective trauma cultural trauma um, immigrant trauma and they may or may not have like these terms to classify how they're feeling necessarily but again like we said social media is the great um equalizer so some of them do uh, but that's that's what I tend to see is a lot of echoes of trauma but I can get more specific if that's helpful yeah please okay so I, I do think there is a lot of this, a similar struggle that I was talking about before about not knowing who they are and that is rooted in like how systems have impacted them in terms of like a sense of feeling not enoughness, but it's mostly because systems, the systems in place are not created to support like well-being in BIPOC or immigrant communities. Yeah. But there is like a deep internalized sense of I'm not enough. And these systems impact us all in that way. So I think that's also why for me, uh, practicing from an, a systems lens really makes sense. But there is like a deep pervasive sense of it, an I'm not enoughness usually that shows up. Are there uh, stigmas in, in Asian communities when it comes to mental health? Yes, yes. <laughs> Which is so interesting, um, given that a lot of like newer therapies tend to pull from Eastern philosophy. And it's always like, Eastern f philosophy says this, Eastern philosophy says this. But growing up, <laughs> emotion, oops, emotions are not really validated. Um, if someone has mental health issues, then there's this like conflation with you. It's always the extreme. So if you have mental health issues, you're going to be further along, probably like the psychosis spectrum, I think is association, or you're just like not right. Something's, something's not right, yeah. but it's very like deeply not right. If that makes sense, like spiritually not right. I think. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a training I attended and this other, I want to say he was a psychiatrist. He's an Asian American psychiatrist. And he was sharing this story about how when he first told his mom that he was interested in becoming like a mental health practitioner, she kind of looked at him and was just like, what is mental health? Also, why do you want to do that? And when she was like using herself as an example, when I want to talk about my problems, I just go scream at a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I scream into a tree. <laughs> and uh, which modality is that aligned with? <laughs> Maybe connecting with nature. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it's very dismissed, but I think it's changing now, but it's very yeah. dismissed. Um, and I the, um, actually went and did like some like self ex self research around like why there is that split of like this comes from Eastern philosophy and yet so many like uh, Asian Americans um, and I'm probably probably many Asian diaspora no longer subscribe to those Eastern ancient values. I was very curious about like why there is that split. Um, and I think specifically with Chinese people actually. A lot of it has to do with uh, cultural revolution trauma and, um, and then also immigrant immigration trauma. So with the cultural revolution, Mao, he basically wanted to unite like one, one Chinese culture. And so because of that, he wanted to discon and he wanted to align more with like Western industrialization right. um, standards, I think. So... Um, there was like a lot of like disconnect from like ancient knowledge, ancient wisdom, and just like we are scientific, we are objective, we are blah, 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 which they, actually there's no objectivity. So we can talk about that par perhaps in the conversation, but that like is a big disconnect from the feeling sides of things. Um, but I think some of the people still know it. Like my dad, I feel like he still, 
when he lets himself go there, he has a lot of, um, he like acknowledges feelings have a place. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, in terms of, uh, I, I know you had mentioned uh, offline in your work that you do bring uh Eastern principles or, mm -hmm. or Eastern philosophies into the work? Like, what are some examples of that? I think um, an example is maybe like less of a focus on the individual and always having the context that the individual is in relationship with the collective. So in Western um, psychotherapies, there's often just a focus on the individual and then maybe the individual in relationship with their mom, their dad. So... A lot of mommy mommy issues and I, I have quotations around this and daddy issues <laughs> but um with like eastern views there would be an um there would be more of a acknowledgement that it's your relationship with your family your nuclear family and also a relationship with the culture and also a relationship with the systems that the culture is based in so the last one is more based in rel relational cultural and liberation ideas but eastern ideas really will take the whole group and there's less of an emphasis on the individual um another thing that eastern ideas always tend to explore is um uh systems so, so we like, uh, for instance, traditional Chinese medicine understands that there's like a, there's like a, sorry, my mind is going so many places. First, there's like an exploration around like, how do we proactively make sure that this person doesn't sink into illness versus like Western modalities tend to be very re reactive. Right. Um, so it kind of tries to understand like what is going well in the person along with what isn't working and tries to balance the two. And so I tend to bring that into my work a lot as a therapist is like that balance between let's explore the trauma, but also let's explore from a strengths-based view what's going on well and how do we bring that in to kind of recalibrate, rebalance the trauma. Um, traditional Chinese medicine also, also understands like a problem in the knee is not just a problem in the knee versus in Western like medical science, you would go to just probably a knee doctor, yeah. very specialist yeah. and working and, and thinking about that knee in isolation. But an Eastern um, philosophy, so traditional Chinese medicine, yoga, probably Ayurveda as well, is going to explore how the knee is working possibly in relationship to the shoulder, but also, and also maybe in relationship to is a knee related to like like a they call it stuck like a stuck energy like a stagnancy yeah and that stagnancy could be related to an emotional or psychological issue actually so it's considering like the body in a whole and those ideas have always resonated with me so that's how i sit with my clients as well yeah and it, it seems to tie in very closely to the somatic experiencing exactly yeah, the, so the a lot of some score, exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly Something that I wanted to go back to was um, what you said about the kind of uh, the differences in dynamic between uh, Western therapy or, or Western uh, philosophy, mm -hmm. but then also the uh, Eastern dynamic being the relationship to the community. Mm -hmm. um, d does that get complicated in immigrant communities where the connection to community, I, I think, the context originally would be that your community aligns with your own values, mm -hmm. but when you are an immigrant, potentially um, the community does not have the same values as you. Sure. Um, what is it like to navigate the nuance of that with someone? That is such a good question. <laughs> I think the answer is that it is very nuanced to navigate. Um, for me, I think I am always coming from this perspective that everyone is doing the best that they can with what they have. And so when I'm helping someone who is maybe having conflict with like their family and wanting to individuate more, but the family is like clinging or they feel that their family is clinging to them, I'm always like working from that perspective of what are the protective strategies that you've built living in context with your family 
and also what is your family's protective strategies? So I'm kind of coming from both views rather than just focusing on how it impacts the individual, if that makes sense, yeah. or like encouraging them to disconnect because that can bring even more discomfort for them actually is like you're trying to help someone find the balance between what what changes can I make so I don't have to uh, feel as stuck, but I don't necessarily want to completely separate from my community, my family, because that also brings increased distress. I'm just trying to titrate everything. Yeah. And, and I think this is probably a very similar or, or maybe like a, a parallel question, but when I think of kind of like the current landscape, you know, I think everybody is feeling like the kind of bipartisanship of it. And, you know, especially in uh, either public discourse or um, on the Internet, it feels like there's a lot of, um, let's say, othering where it's mm. like, you know, this group is different to us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously our group is the good one and that means the other group is the bad one. Yeah. And how do you uh, think about in, in terms of uh, working with immigrants and how do you think about the kind of um, the nuance of this person would like to respect their cultural heritage or the um, traditions while also being part of a community and, and kind of like integrating how do you separate both of those things out? Um, like separating individuation versus... I, I, I don't know if there's a, a simple answer to this. <laughs> I, I think it is probably like a very broad question. But uh, on the one hand, you have uh, being true to your, your culture and your mm -hmm. heritage, while also, um, you know, wanting to have healthy relationships with the broader community. And oh, like the community outside of like the greater greater community the yeah. collective community exactly mm -hmm. yeah how to balance that mm -hmm. well for me i feel that exploring the relationship that you have with your with your own culture first and healing those wounds because most people have some type of dysfunction like i don't like that word actually but some type of strained relationship there with their culture, with their identity, et cetera. Um, healing that will, in my mind, influence like their relationship with the greater whole. So they're not in, I those issues aren't in isolation. Um, and I try to, I, we talked about this in the training that the YWCA did with Explore Austin. I'm always trying to embody this idea of we're asking not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you yeah, and what happened to you and your people. And so I really try to, I might explicitly teach this to my clients or I might, uh, it might just be more implicit, but I think I'm always trying to teach a client to ask not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. So there's like a ripple effect in terms of trying to be less reactive when we're faced with differences. We're going to have that knee jerk like, I don't like that or like that's weird. Yeah. Um, and so we're not trying to get rid of that necessarily, but we're trying not to act from that place. And so I think that's how maybe I navigate that is consistently having people explore what's the bigger context here in any interpersonal conflict that they're in, actually. Yeah. And still honoring the real charge, the raw charge, not trying to minimize that. I really want to make sure, make sure that's clear. But eventually being able to see if there is like a desire to move into this, this context seeking, this um, connective, more connective, expansive place over. I keep motioning over here to the right and I was left on the other place. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think like when I look at those discussions and, and, you know, kind of like, um, like I mentioned the othering or like the criticism mm -hmm. of, uh, the other side. And, and I, I think from the work I've done, like I can kind of see like, Oh, this person is speaking from 
this is their actual perception of self or their mm -hmm. own issues are coloring this. And yes. like the, the group that they're criticizing is a lot closer to them than <laughs> uh, farther from them or different exactly. from them. And, you know, there's that uh, unwillingness to step into connection. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I think the unfortunate thing right now, and, I, you know, I feel like this probably moves in waves is that's rewarded right now or, mm. you know, like that's, that's seen as being strong to kind of like criticize or, or be virtuous and, and all of that stuff. Sure. No, we could really get into this, but um, a lot of times, so U.S. culture in general kind of encourages competition and scarcity mindset, actually. And these ideas can trickle down into any school of thought. So it can definitely trickle into social justice spaces as well. And then when that happens, you're just perpetuating these systems that you're trying to fight against. Um, and that can, and, but people will feel very like righteous, like I'm doing the right thing. Right. And, um, this is not me saying that I'm not saying anything bad about social justice movements or activists. I'm very social justice oriented myself, but that's something I definitely see. And I try to talk about that nuance and trainings as well, actually. Um, but I know the reason why I'm giving the caveat is like people can very easily, maybe not understand the nuance of my words there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but a lot of times, like you were saying, we're not so different from each other and there can be like a lot of projection actually. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I'm always like curious about, well, let's do a U-turn and what's actually happening for you. And when, we, we rep when we're curious about that and repair that, oftentimes, that deactivates like that push away that we have from other groups because there's like an ability to see the humanity in the other person because you're not like bracing against your own discomfort with yourself or with your own culture, et cetera, right. or coming from that place of fear anymore. Yeah. And I, I think probably like that's driven a lot by identity or like mm -hmm. sense of self or, or ego, mm -hmm. um, you know, like this very strong, like I am, a and that person's b so yeah versus if you're coming from this place of just like it's not it's not so stark we're more like a b all the time right. together and you just have that like mm, that's the place you're always coming from you won't really have as much of that like power over tension actually yeah absolutely um okay so to uh, switch directions again a little bit. Um, it, we touched on the somatic piece a little bit, mm -hmm. but how would you describe uh, somatic experiencing or somatic therapy? Somatic experiencing or somatic therapy, it typically honors that, it typically honors that we have, let's see. Okay, first it honors the role of the body in well-being in the first place. Also, usually, usually many somatic models also recognize that there are like uh, five different five different channels of knowing. Um, so usually there is like a feeling channel, there is a um, image channel, there is a sensation, body sensations channel, maybe movement, and then I feel like I'm forgetting another one. We have all these different ways of knowing, and typically in Western or U.S. Um, systems of knowing culture thought, we tend to only target the cognitive, the rational knowing. So a lot of somatic therapies will try to reverse that and really spend more time getting to know the physical sensation, the movement, and the emotional ways of knowing. So I think that's like the most concise way I can explain somatic therapies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think uh, in my own experience, I, I grew up very logical and, and very mm -hmm. rational and had also shut off a lot of those feeling parts. Mm -hmm. And so if you are beginning in your work with someone who is not used to um, experiencing things somatically or just mm -hmm. is in a state of disconnection mm -hmm. with their body, how can they start to cultivate a sense of connection? Sure. I 
I think I'm going to speak more to like how I work with that. And then maybe from there, we'll have an answer to how someone can um, cultivate that for themselves. I guess I'm stuck on this idea that first they have to be like curious. So there has to be a curiosity in the first place. But um, how I work with that personally is first off, I'm a recovering avoidant and intellectualizer myself. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to put that out there. Um, What I do is I really meet people where they're at. And um, I guess I try to spark the curiosity. So for instance, if I'm sitting with someone who's just very much like wanting to or not wanting but needing to intellectualize everything um and wants to stay in the talk plane of things or again i don't want to say once but that's where they're coming from is that's their on mode is in the talking then as you can tell i use a lot of gestures when i'm talking and even with that i'm a little more intentional when i'm in session so i would i would uh, maybe for example they're saying a lot I say like there's a lot here and just start to plant this like the seeds that there is a connection between uh, movement and what's happening in the body so from here they're seeing me do these like there's a lot to unpack here where do you want to start if someone's very activated my like where do we want to start and kind of make this a grounding movement um and planting the seeds that there is a connection there And then after that's planted, then I might be curious about, as you see my hands move, this would be like sessions later, not in the same session. As you see my hands move, I'm curious if anything shifts for you. We know that there is like a a connection between the mind and the body. And so then after watching me, then I might invite, let's see what happens if you move your body and then what happens to shift there. So I think there needs to be sort of like this curiosity or this buy-in first that the mind and the body are connected with one another, that emotions, feelings, and thoughts and physical sensations all matter. Um, And then from there, I I guess like the invitation is to experiment with how you can see how that might play out. Um, There's many ways to get started. I think that a lot of people who might be more in the intellectual plane They might get a lot out of doing something that is like more solely movement based that isn't necessarily bringing in the all the channels like the emotions quite yet but just seeing like what happens when you move your body and does that shift your mood but not necessarily going too in in depth with that um so what are some examples of uh movement based practices yeah so um for me, actually, I am also a registered yoga teacher, and I will say that yoga actually really, my own practice of yoga actually did, it's going to sound so cliche, but it actually really helped me learn how to decolonize my relationship with myself and my mind. Um, so many yogic spaces can be kind of a more aesthetic space and more uh, focus on athleticism and perfectionism. That's where I started whenever I first got into yoga. But a lot of the teachings and what kept me going is um, there's this, there's the, you get to explore through a flow from start to finish how you might feel differently um, and when you're very like mindfully and intentionally moving through the movements and taking that moment to ask, is this actually want to, well, how I want to move my body? Do I want to get in this pose instead of blindly following? Because before, um, before I had that realization that you can have this really like a mindful, mutual relationship to yourself through the practice of yoga, um, it would be sort of like more of this disconnected, I'm just going through, I'm like really strong and that feels good. And that's also how I approach most exercise before that. Um, but now even running is like an opportunity for me to really explore how do I want to move my body? Do I want to move in this speed? What is it like to feel my feet on the ground? Right. Um, but I got a little distracted. I'm so sorry. Um. No, I I, I think that perfectly answers the question. I I mean, I I did want to dig into that sentence. Uh, I I think you said decolonize your relationship with yourself. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, so Colin, the ideology of colonization is like a group overpowering another. Right. And then you can see that in other like, uh, what's the term? what's the right term 
like ways of thought is like dominate over rationality dominates over emotions um the mind body split that um what is it like basically uh, basically um <laughs> my words basically only prioritizing like rationality over emotion um so with decolonizing you are trying to like actively do the opposite and instead of this power over dynamic you're having like a very like mutual dialogue and when you learn how to do that with yourself that really shapes how you like do that with all ideas all thoughts actually yeah so instead of uh, a simple example is like in western societies or capitalistic industrialized societies there can be like this um like need to override your needs to survive something as simple as i'm not gonna i'm gonna skip my lunch or i'm gonna skip going to the restroom i just gotta get this work done yeah and but that's like a very like power over dynamic and what would it be like to really ask yourself like uh, let me honor this need to go to the restroom eat the food that i want to eat when i want to it's a very different relationship than always prioritizing like mind over body or like always wanting to like having to go the hard way i guess like coming back to the beginning of our conversation like forcefully putting yourself in a situation that doesn't actually bring pleasure or feel good yeah yeah i, I mean I, I feel like that's a very common social media theme is mm. like hey this person is doing something difficult therefore it should be celebrated yeah and, and sometimes i look at that and i'm like I, I would not trade lives with that person <laughs> Yeah, but I used to, I actually used to like very much be like that. I would like have a lot of pride in having a really high pain tolerance, not being scared. Yeah, same. Like yeah. just <laughs> grind till you drop. Exactly. Yeah. And then I would have like real pride around not dropping, you know, but at what cost? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, being a little kinder to yourself, being maybe a better way of doing things. Yes, and the much more sustainable um and it just like can translate into you're not going to want to dominate like other people because you're not dominate you're not so used to dominating yourself. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, to kind of go back to the uh, somatic piece mm -hmm. and, and kind of like when I think of my own journey, like again, the context being starting out from a place of disconnection and like my first intro to therapy was. Uh, very traditional psychoanalysis and like very cerebral and very verbose mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and just nothing no attention paid to the somatic at all sure and you know like i would do uh meditation and had kind of like dabbled into yoga um at different times and, and kind of like tried to cultivate a mindfulness practice but I don't think that stuff really connected until mm. years later, like maybe five to seven years in. And do you think it's a, it's a case of like someone can only really connect that when they're ready? Or do you think that can be jumpstarted? Uh, maybe a little bit of both. That's such yeah. a great question. Because <laughs> I think you're probably like having all of those seeds planted around like, oh, when I move my body, I might feel a different way. But it's not necessarily like, you're not going deeper than that surface level like realization but then sometimes things shift and all of a sudden it just shh. um i also just remembered something else that i would recommend people if they're wanting to be curious about yeah. like somatic work um something really easy is to start to bring attention to your posture and see what making small changes to your posture how that influences quality of thoughts emotions other sensations etc um like one example i can give is um well we tend to be very like forward like a front facing forward leaning um society like this um but this pull can also first off it can cycle connection but that's not where i'm gonna go <laughs> i'm gonna go towards more like it can um basically if we're like this all the time I know that this is not a this is a podcast, so I'm feeling very sheepish right now. But if you're like uh, more in this like very le forward leaning position, it can also start to feel like the precursor to like hunching down, for instance. Right. 
hiding, ducking, and then that can start to send signals of unsafety to your brain. And because we know that actually 80% of the message that the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in the body, goes from the brain stem, side of the face, side of the neck, through all your internal organs, this nerve um, sends, is in charge of sending signals of safety or unsafety from your body back up to the brain. And 80% of its information is body first and, up, and then up to the brain. So it's less about like a, I'm making a conscious decision to move my body and then I move my body. It's more my, my brain is getting signals from my body and then it adjusts very unconsciously. Yeah. So when you're stuck in these positions of like, I'm always maybe perpetually in a posture of threat, it colors all of your thoughts. It colors all of your emotions. You might always be in this state of urgency and this state of um, unease. And so just like, just being curious about what happens if you like ground down and elongate the spine. If you even just like support like the back of your head, just noticing what that's like, you may or may not notice very large differences depending on how embodied you already are. But just being curious to see if there's any shift for you can be really helpful. So I think starting with small postures. Um, not sitting like a gargoyle for eight hours a day. It's not good <laughs> yeah. for your mental health. Yeah. No, but also like driving definitely like yeah. it, it basically activates all of the stress muscles, the fight or flight muscles. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of things about the modern industrialized world that really don't support like well-being even just from that bottom up kind of a way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned uh, your yoga teaching, mm -hmm. and I, I did want to dig into what is uh, trauma-conscious yoga? Trauma-conscious yoga is developed by this really lovely woman, Natita Gassel, and she is, has just moved back to Austin, actually. But she developed this modality that brings together somatic therapies, yoga, um, yogic philosophy, and then also like working with trauma specifically. So it's a modality that... It's meant for like uh, mental health practitioners to learn how to integrate the body more into the therapeutic space. And it also is really lovely because um, the way that she shaped it is it also helps yoga teachers learn how to be more trauma informed as well and therapeutic. So not necessarily therapists, but more therapeutic. And there's also been other people who come like um, I feel like there's a dentist one training actually oh, that I was in. Yeah. Wow. So. It's really cool. <laughs> and, I mean, what can people expect from a trauma conscious yoga session? Yeah, such a good question. Um, it is going to be a lot more invitational than what you would uh, experience at a traditional yoga studio here in the West. Um, so you're going to have a lot more cues around if you'd like, when you're ready. Um, more invitation to sense into yourself. So some of that decolonized perspective of, you get to be the expert in how you want to move your body. Um, there is also going to likely be a lot more choice. So there is, um, and that's one big tenant of trauma-informed work in general is like an emphasis in choice. Yeah. But instead of just moving your body in this one way, you're gonna, you can do it this way, this way, or this way. There's a lot of playfulness too a lot of times rather than like com competition. Um, it's not necessarily always going to be like a gentle flow necessarily if that's not what you're looking for because you get to shape your practice any way you want. Um, but it is going to be like nervous system informed and also your instructor. So be very like very careful with language in general likely. Um, we know that we can't necessarily, we don't know what's going to trigger um we don't know what everyone's triggers are necessarily, but we try to be careful to try to speak to the most sensitive person in the space at all times right. and cue to that. Um, and the poses are going to be like selected oftentimes to be more nourishing and more supportive of someone who may have experienced trauma. Yeah. In, in terms of the felt experience for the individual who's taking mm -hmm, the class mm -hmm. um, or the session, is the idea that um, they are, maybe not actively is the right word, but um, that they are processing trauma as they're doing that? Or is it meant mm -hmm. as a complement to their talk therapy practice? I think that if your session is being led by a trauma conscious practitioner who is a mental health practitioner and a um, 
yoga instructor, then it can be more in the realm of trauma processing. So usually this would be done more on a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so through these movements, we might be moving through stuck energy or trauma. In a like group setting, or maybe if you're taking it with a trauma conscious practitioner who's a yoga instructor, but doesn't have the mental health background, it's gonna be very therapeutic and supportive and you might use it in conjunction. Um, but the way that I utilize it with people is one-on-one, -on -one, it is gonna be maybe more in the realm of processing and then in groups, it could be supportive. There can be some invitations depending on how much I know the person's nervous system or the group's nervous system to move through. Yeah. Um, so uh, something that you wrote on your website that uh, really resonated with me was uh, the sentence, we heal and grow through connections. Mm -hmm. And again, when I kind of think of like the modern day landscape, I, I think a lot of these I mean, especially men's issues mm -hmm. come through a sense of disconnection. And mm -hmm. I, I think the internet has uh, maybe tricked us a little bit in terms of uh, feeling connected, but not actually really being mm. in connection. And, and this sense of kind of isolation and, and loneliness mm. being exacerbated by that, where on one hand, you can have uh, access to communities and sometimes very niche communities mm -hmm. where um, those values or, or interests resonate with you, but at the same time, uh, it's kind of like a, a proxy for real connection or mm. like a bastardization of uh, that real connected experience. Mm. And, and so if um, you are somebody who is maybe uh, experiencing that disconnection or maybe more broadly, you have not really had that experience of like healthy connection growing up mm -hmm. or, or that was not modeled for you. Mm -hmm. How can you start to venture out into the world and find mm -hmm. that connection or um, start to gravitate towards healthy connection? Such a big question. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, first, I think I'm going to back up and just to help pe invite people to acknowledge that if you are struggling with a sense of disconnection and deep isolation, just know that this, it's it's not you and it's like our society, um, our modern society that supports a lot of disconnection. Um, so just really recognizing it's not you, it's the system and create starting to create that distance. I think with that distance, maybe then you'll be able to feel like more regulated enough to be in, not to get into the weeds, but in um, polyvagal theory, there's a part of our nervous system when we're feeling safe, we'll feel like socially engaged. When we're not, when we're experiencing like a sense of threat, our desire for social engagement goes offline because we just lose the capacity for it. So I think being able to find any space where you start to feel a little more grounded, a little more um, like safe in your system, a little more regulated, that will make it feel more accessible to start venturing out and find community and find connection. Um, in general, I think it's really hard to find community as an adult here in the U.S. Yeah. So... I think that maybe using social media as a vehicle to meet up in person maybe is one of the like most accessible ways today to seek connection, I think. But you have to be feel like safe enough to be able to go and do that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, on that topic of safety, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, that that really resonates with me. But then also, I think it's accurate to say people who are not used to experiencing a sense of safety end up being or, or expressing themselves in a way that is probably unsafe for others. Yeah. Be because, you know, either it hasn't been modeled for them or they're being reactive to that yes. feeling of uh, non-safety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so... Can you start to cultivate those connections and communities while still not having cultivated that sense of personal safety? I 
there's a part of me that wants to say like go to therapy and start exploring this um so that you have like that safe container um but i feel like that might be a like a cop-out answer (laughs) (laughs) but do i feel that people can start yes yes i do actually because they kind of work in conjunction with one another the more connected we are the more like regulated and safe we're going to feel in our body and then the more likely we're going to be able to feel connected um can people like but where to start i guess is the biggest i guess this is where why i'm like wanting to gravitate towards like so if you start to if you're able to connect with a therapist and you start to be able to explore these topics in session and start to kind of build a secure base with your therapist that can translate out to the real world um but i know that getting connected with therapists is very difficult these days it's really difficult in austin um so i guess i'm finding myself at sort of a loss for a solution right now yeah i mean (laughs) that that can be the true answer and you know um and you know like I, i think uh, you had mentioned earlier unconditional positive regard, and I, I do want to come back to that idea, but I, I think not everybody experiences that feeling from therapists or like it's just not mm-hmm. a fit for feeling that. So I, I think, you know, that experience of just going to see a mental health professional may not engender that sense of safety with someone, Absolutely. even though that... Uh, abstractly is the right step for them it it might not produce the desired outcome absolutely you could have a really uncomfortable experience or it could take a really long time to get to that space um yeah yeah i mean it it kind of speaks to something you mentioned uh, a few moments ago in terms of like that cyclical nature of Mm -hmm. like i i need safety i experience safety i myself become more safe and then that being kind of like that flywheel. But if you don't hit that first step of this person is engendering a sense of safety for me, it, it either takes the person venturing out there yeah. and, and, you know, being vulnerable or, or putting themselves out there or they retreat and they don't get exactly. that experience. This is why like the indi- like collective issues cannot be fixed on the individual level. We're actually seeing that right now in um, like in like real time. So I think the real answer is lofty. So I don't know how we get there right now. But the real answer is like the community has to be able to support you and come to you in these times. So we have to just as a culture and as a community recognize when people are hurting, we go to them so that it's not the burden isn't on the hurt individual or the um, isolated individual because it's so hard to what is it? What's that term? (laughs) just so hard to get out of the ditch when you're way down there yeah. you need someone to come in and, and they have to know that you're hurting themselves and come and pull you out yeah. um in conflict resolution they have like a similar concept as like a triangle so basically the idea is if you are as a conflict resolution person facilitating a group you set all these expectations so people know that it is like this collective communal space to try to avoid like the power struggle and then the idea is when um, a harm is made, the person, the individual who's hurt, isn't responsible for calling out the person who's made the harm. Mm. Someone else comes in and rescues that person. I'm so sorry. Okay. I keep hitting the mic. That's all good. <laughs> so I think that idea needs to be applicable to just like culture in general, society right. in general. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean... Um something we we had talked about was um this idea of unconditional positive regard and Mm -hmm. um this being an idea um kind of brought to the popular culture by a psychologist named carl rogers Mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit to what that is and then how that shows up in therapeutic work unconditional positive regard is seeing the value in someone regardless of their beliefs their thoughts their actions what they're doing um There's this other phrase that I have on my website, too, around always trying to see the hurt child underneath the um, protective strategies. And I think that's what unconditional positive regard is in like a nice brief sentence is we're always 
trying to connect with the hurt child and see someone in their best light regardless of what actions they're doing. We understand that behaviors are ways of trying to meet needs and sometimes we don't know exactly like how to do that in an effective way. Yeah, and uh, suspension of judgment and uh, exactly you know, withholding criticism and that kind of stuff. Exactly, and I also let you, I think where I was trying to go earlier is I let you be who you are without feeling threatened. Like I don't have to come in and change you. Yeah. You get to be you and you get to be where you're at and I'm going to meet you there. Again, on your website, you you have the phrase, uh, all grown-ups are, sorry, all adults are grown-up kids. Mm. And uh, y- your work is around uncovering the precious child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I-, I think that is a very, well, first of all, it's a very intuitive concept for mm-hmm. me now. Mm-hmm. But also, I-, I think, I mean, even with as much work as I've done on that, it's still quite a complicated concept. And I think it is one that is complicated for people in general. Mm. And so what does it mean to uncover your precious child? Um, For me, I think the first off, it is recognizing that when we are in distress, our prefrontal cortex goes offline. So this is like our part of our brain that has the ration and the reasoning and also maybe where in some modalities we think of like the wise adult, the wise child, no, wise adult. Um, That goes offline. And so just like on the neuroscience level, we are all operating from that emotion, the high emotion and the brainstem, like the impulse react, react part of us. And that's like mirrors what, um, like how a child is since our prefrontal cortex just doesn't fully develop until now the research is indicating like late 20s. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so just like I would say on the neuroscience level, we are acting as if we're children because we don't have that module, that prefrontal cortex accessible to us to modulate our thoughts, our feelings, um, and to really make like rational decisions in the moment. Once you honor that, I think... Some of us have to learn how to do this because we weren't modeled this ever, but then it becomes more intuitive of if I were sitting with a child and they were having a really bad day and throwing like a tantrum, instead of trying to reason with them with rationality, that never goes well, by the way. It usually (laughs) incites bigger tantrums to the point where you can't like calm them down at all. You might like sit with and you might really just sit next to. And so you're doing this like if you were doing this uncovering yourself, you would be like metaphorically sitting next to yourself in the therapeutic space. It's like I'm not going to try to challenge you or um, try to like have you identify your distorted thoughts. I'm going to really just be with and ask you, like, what is it like to have these feelings? Yeah. What happened? And then we go from there. So um, with yourself, it is like, what's going on here? What do I need? What is it like to feel these things that I'm feeling right now instead of trying to um, rationalize? It's also like with a child, you're usually not saying all of these things that your inner critic says. For the most part, again, every family is different. So you may not have had these experiences modeled to you. Um, But I think in an ideal world, you're not using that same language that your inner critic uses. Um, I think it's easier to see the preciousness in a child oftentimes than it is to see the preciousness in an adult. But the work is always trying to recognize that we really are grown up children. That little hurt child, it doesn't just grow up on its own. It has to be like nourished. Yeah. to grow up otherwise there's a part of us that always stays in that frozen place right it's more like a continuum yeah 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 mm-hmm. um so as we um come to a close here something that i'm curious about um in, in terms of at this point in your career are there things that you would change about the modern approach to mental health or mm. to therapy or um, you know, 
what parts do you think that um, the industry or practice as a whole could do better? Mm. I feel this is a hard one for me to answer just because um, all of the modalities I practice from, I would not change anything about them. Um, but I, I have like a hard, I told you before, it's like hard for me to know like what the greater bubble is doing. Right. Um, but I guess I would say in general, I want people to be... Um, people centered to really see the person in front of you it's not about the diagnoses it's a not about trying to challenge your client it is really about being with um a lot of so the mental health field is really intertwined with the medical field because of insurance and then because of that there is like a lot of like a push to have short-term therapies and rush people out and then that puts a lot of just constraints on the therapeutic relationship so I would want us to move towards really valuing that some people can really benefit from short term, but a lot of people really benefit from long term or midterm as well. And to really like honor that. And when you have more space like that, I think there is more space to really connect interpersonally, really authentic, really deeply instead of like worrying about intervention, 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 intervention. Yeah. yeah. So less intervention based and more people based is my general invitation for the medical mental health field yeah amazing <laughs> well Bree, um we are at time i have really enjoyed this conversation and i think people listening will get a lot out of the very wide and diverse range mm. of topics we covered so <laughs> i wanted to say thank you very much for showing up today and sharing space with me thanks for having me yeah this is great thank yeah. you so much take care <laughs>